Welcome to this Jeremy Bamber and White House Farm podcast. In this episode, we set out two of the issues surrounding the telephones in White House Farm. First, we'll explore the use of the kitchen telephone and how the police made at least one telephone call from the house on the 7th of August 1985, which may explain why the kitchen telephone, which had been used by Chila Cafell to make a documented emergency call at 6.09am, was never seized as an exhibit and was never forensically tested. Next, we unravel the mystery of the hidden telephone, which was discovered in a pile of old magazines in the kitchen. We'll discuss what the police and witnesses said about this, and how evidence was presented to the Director of Public Prosecutions and to the jury to assert that Jeremy Bamber was responsible for hiding this telephone, and how he did this to prevent his parents being able to telephone the police. What the jury were told was at best misleading, at worst a deliberate lie presented to support the Crown's assertion that Jeremy was responsible for the shootings. Here's an outline of the documented use of the kitchen telephone on the evening of the 6th and early hours of the 7th of August 1985. 9.30pm on 6th of August 1985. White House Farm Secretary Barbara Wilson telephoned the farm and spoke to Neville. 10 p.m. Pamela spoke to her sister June Bamber and niece Sheila Caffell. 3.15 a.m. approximately, Neville Bamber telephoned his son Jeremy Bamber. 3.26 a.m. Neville Bamber telephoned the police to alert them to the unfolding events at the farm. Prior to 3.42 a.m., Police checks established the telephone was engaged, but it's unknown who was using it. Shortly after 3.42am, BT reported the telephone was off the hook and they could hear a dog barking. 5.47am, the telephone was engaged again. 5.50am, the line was now open again and the BT operator connected the telephone to a police internal phone line. 6.09 6.09 a.m. A 999 call was made from the White House farm. So there are at least seven documented occasions that the telephone in the farmhouse was in use between 9.30 p.m. on the 6th of August 1985 and 6.09 a.m. on the 7th of August 1985, all of which were prior to the raid team forcing entry at 7.35 a.m. approximately. The last person to use the telephone, according to the documents, was Sheila at 6.09am. Therefore, her fingerprints would be on the handset, on the dial, and possibly on the base. However, a fingerprint examination was never conducted on the kitchen telephone, and it looks pristine and clean in the crime scene photographs. This raises the obvious question of why were fingerprints not taken from the telephone? And how did the cream dial kitchen telephone look so clean if it had been used by Sheila at 6.09am? Surely it would have had at least traces of blood on it. These are important questions which we can now answer. And it all boils down to the police interference with the scene. We now have the evidence that two police officers used the kitchen telephone on the morning of the tragedies. These officers were DCI Harris and DI Cook. Unfortunately, owing to legal proceedings, we're currently unable to disclose the evidence in relation to Cook, but the evidence proves that he used the kitchen telephone on the morning of the tragedies. I am, however, able to discuss the evidence we have in relation to DCI Harris, and we can prove he used this telephone. The full radio log which recorded events as they unfolded at the scene, contains an entry at 8.20 a.m., which sets out that the Assistant Chief Constable Peter Simpson had requested to speak to the Divisional Commander, Chief Inspector Harris, who was inside White House Farm. It is possible that this request may have been regarding the issue that Chief Inspector Harris and Chief Inspector Gibbons had seen Sheila 
with a single gunshot wound at 8.13am when they first entered the house, which strongly suggested that Sheila had committed suicide. Information that may have been relayed to Simpson through other channels. It is known that Harris did contact Simpson, although the content of this telephone conversation has never been disclosed, and fresh evidence now allows us, with some degree of certainty, to establish the time of the call Harris made to ACC Simpson, which we will discuss later in this presentation. How can we be certain that Harris used the kitchen telephone to contact Mr Simpson and not one of the other phones which were available in the house? In his reports to the Director of Public Prosecutions, dated September and November 1985, DSI Ainsley openly admitted that a police officer had used a telephone from inside the house on the morning of the 7th of August 1985, but that the officer had used the blue telephone in the upstairs office. In his final report to the DPP, DSI Ainsley said, the SEPTA 100 telephone was, as stated, still connected in the office and was in working order on the morning of 7th August 1985, being used by the Essex Police Tactical Firearms Group, who were unable to use the kitchen telephone for obvious reasons. He also repeated this evidence when questioned by the Metropolitan Police for the Stoken Church inquiry in 2002. Ainsley said, The kitchen telephone, this telephone was in the first floor office at the rear of the farm, and the TFG, Tactical Firearms Group, used it as they considered it divorced from the scene. With regards of who used a telephone at the scene, Ainsley responded to the interviewing offices in 2002 that this would be established, presumably by reading the statements of the TFG officers or by discussing the importance of the use of the various telephones in the house. Further, in a deliberate act to deceive the DPP in 1985 and the Met Police in 2002, Ainsley stated, The phone in the office was, to the best of my recollection, a separate line. However, Ainsley was fully aware that there was just a single telephone line at White House Farm and knew there was a single telephone number, as well as having the evidence from four telephone engineers, BT operators, and the farm secretary. The fresh evidence reveals Ainsley was, not for the first time, being less than honest in his knowledge of which telephone line was used, or indeed, who used it, as he had access to the evidence regarding ACC Simpson's request for Harris to contact him over a landline. We can now establish that in making his call to Mr Simpson, Harris cannot have used the telephone in the office as Ainsley asserted, because he never entered that room. The only room he did enter, which had a telephone in it, was the kitchen. How do we know this? In his witness statement, dated the 3rd of October 1985, Harris set out which rooms he entered in the house. He said, I entered the following parts of the house. Kitchen, main hallway, lounge, main stairs, main bedroom, second bedroom, twin boys' bedroom. Therefore, Harris had never entered the office and can only have used the telephone in the kitchen. Had it been known at the trial that Harris made at least one telephone call using the kitchen telephone prior to any photographs being taken of the scene, it is likely that those photographs, which later show the handset of the phone being off the cradle and next to the base unit on the kitchen worktop, would have been excluded as having no evidential value. However, the fact Harris used the phone was unknown to the defence at the time of the trial. In 2002, the CPS instructed the Metropolitan Police to investigate issues and to collate evidence, including conducting interviews and obtaining new statements if necessary, in readiness for the appeal. This was known as Operation Stoken Church. The Metropolitan Police made efforts to establish which of the officers who'd entered the house had used the telephone 
and which telephone they'd used. They conducted a series of interviews with several officers who'd been in the house to see if they'd seen anything or had any knowledge of this issue. Every officer they interviewed denied any knowledge of having used or seen the telephone being used. However, Stoke and Church only interviewed 10 officers who'd been in the house, when it's now known that considerably more, a total of 43 individuals, entered the house prior to the first photograph being taken. The 10 officers who Stoke and Church asked were all members of the Firearms Support Unit and were PC Alexander Smart, PC Collins, PC Delgado, PC Hall, PC Manners, PC Mildenhall, Inspector Montgomery, PC Rosger, PC Webb and PC Woodcock. Harris, who we can now prove used the kitchen telephone, was not asked about it. So Essex Police had been deceptive and had not disclosed to Stoke and Church the true number of people who attended the scene. In fact, at the 2002 appeal, it was still asserted that only 29 police officers attended the incident, not all of whom entered the house. D.S. Stanley Bryan Jones was interviewed by two members of the Stoke and Church Inquiry in 2002. During his interviews, D.S. Jones was asked if he had any knowledge of any police officer using the kitchen telephone that morning. D.S. Jones described the position of the telephone when he saw it and stated that it was hanging down. However, this is not how the telephone or the handset appear on the disclosed crime scene photographs. In his interview, he stated, D.I. Brown, what's your memory then, or what's your understanding of what occurred about the line and keeping it open and the call? D.S. Jones, if I remember rightly, when they got there, the phone was hanging down. I think that's what was my recollection, what they've said. And I've got a feeling in my own mind. Might have been the photograph, don't know. Jeremy said he'd phoned up and said, she's gone berserk, she's got a gun, then the phone went dead. The trouble is with that, if the phone went dead, it means somebody has put the receiver down, right? and it could have been put down with the hand. D.I. Brown. You mean the buttons put down? D.S. Jones. And with the phone still hanging down? D.I. Brown. Yes. D.S. Jones. So therefore it would cut it off, so it's completely dead now. He's got the phone hanging down. So at the end of the day, there's nowhere to go. You just couldn't fathom it out. D.S. Jones was then asked if he had any knowledge of a police officer using the kitchen telephone, to which he responded, And they wouldn't use the one in the kitchen, I wouldn't think, because I'm sure the photograph showed it hanging down. I can't see any policeman using them, putting them back, and then hanging it down again. In total, D.S. Jones stated the phone was hanging down five times and refers to seeing photographs of the phone in this position twice. D.S. Jones also provided evidence which indicates that when he saw the phone in the kitchen, it was not as pristine and clean as the photograph show it was by 10 a.m. Jones said, I can't even see anybody using the phone in that kitchen. The state of it. Do you know what I mean? There's no way I'd want to use that phone. Who else? saw it hanging down and contaminated. Until the missing statements from everyone who entered the house are disclosed, we can only speculate. Using the evidence of Stan Jones, we can now establish that Harris must have used the kitchen telephone to contact Mr. Simpson between 9.16am when D.S. Jones entered the house and saw the telephone hanging down and in a state and 9.35am when Harris left the scene. It is a self-evident fact that someone, maybe even Harris himself, retrieved the telephone from the hanging down position and cleaned it prior to using it. This may, therefore, be the reason that the kitchen telephone was never seized or forensically examined.
White House Farm only had a single telephone line, but because it was a large property, there were four telephones in various rooms. These were a cream dial telephone normally kept in the master bedroom, a blue digital dial telephone in the upstairs office, a cordless telephone which was kept in the kitchen, alongside a fawn-coloured telephone with a digital keypad. The fact that two were normally kept in the kitchen was confirmed by Neville's secretary, Barbara Wilson, at trial. She was asked by the prosecution, was there any other telephone that was normally in the kitchen? To which she replied, yes, there used to be a press button one beside the cordless phone. There were two there. In late July 1985, there'd been a huge thunderstorm which had caused damage to the phone system and to a telephone in the house. A telephone engineer, Douglas Pike, made a statement that on the 5th of August 1985, he called at White House Farm and was let into the house by Sheila. Mr Pike gave evidence that he took away the kitchen cordless telephone for repair and he did not leave a replacement. The fact that Sheila let him into the house is also set out in an Essex police message number 113 dated the 18th of September 1985, which states he went to White House Farm on 5th of the 8th 1985 to collect a cordless phone, was met by Sheila. Oddly, he was not asked any questions about Sheila and how she appeared to be before the tragedies. Because Mr Pike had now removed a telephone for repair, this meant that three telephones now remained in the house. The blue one in the office, the push-button telephone in the kitchen, which was a fawn-coloured telephone, and the cream dial telephone normally kept in the main bedroom. The farm secretary, Mrs Wilson, had been on holiday and was not entirely sure where the telephones were moved to as a result of this storm. Nevertheless, Mrs Jean Bootle, the cleaning lady, testified in court that the telephones had gone wrong so many times in the past year that she described it as musical phones simply because the phones were moved around so frequently by the Bamba family. She said it was common practice for the cream telephone from the bedroom to be moved down into the kitchen. Mrs Bootle also testified that Neville liked to use the cordless telephone and would take it around the house with him, which was especially useful as there was no telephone in his den, also referred to as the downstairs office. When the police finished their initial scenes of crime investigations on the 9th of August 1985 and handed the keys to the family, Anne Eaton and Jean Bootle started cleaning the house. There were quite a number of people who were in and out of the house after that, including the executor of the estates, who was also Neville's accountant, Basil Cock, the secretary, Barbara Wilson, Uncle Robert Beauflower, his wife, Aunt Pamela Beauflower, relative Chris Neville, cousin David Beauflower, and his wife, Karen, cousin Anthony Pargeter, and Anne Eaton's husband, Peter Eaton. By the 23rd of August 1985, Jeremy had been back to the farm and Barbara Wilson had recommenced her duties as farm secretary, reporting to Jeremy. Jean Bootle had also returned to her regular cleaning duties. While carrying out admin of the farmhouse and the business of N and J Bamber, Jeremy had increased the wages of the farm workers during this time and also asked Mrs Wilson to clear out many of the papers in the office for him. He asked Mrs Bootle to dispose of other belongings in the house which were not of any significance. As we all know, after a family member's died, we have to face the difficult task of removing their belongings and Jeremy was no different from any other person in facing the emotional and practical difficulties of doing this. Mrs Bootle testified that Jeremy had asked her to remove a pile of magazines which were next to the kitchen cupboards. It was during this clear-out she discovered the fawn-coloured telephone within the magazines. She testified that she asked Jeremy what to do with the telephone, to which he replied, that's a spare. Mrs Bootle then handed the telephone to Mrs Wilson, who put it in the downstairs office. 
The police later asked Mrs Bootle to check the telephone to see if it was in working order. It was. Mrs Wilson also testified that she too checked the telephone and found it to be working. Not satisfied with their word and determined to make as big an issue as possible about this so-called hidden telephone, Ainsley requested that a telephone engineer should attend the house to test the telephones and the sockets. The tests were conducted by Melvin Adcock, and according to Ainsley, he informed the DPP that it was recovered from there and tested by the witness Adcock, pages 816 to 818, and found to be in perfect working order, as was the bedroom socket. Likewise, the kitchen telephone, socket and office telephone were all in working order. Oddly, the statement made by Mr Adcock dated the 11th of September 1985, which is listed on the Holmes Box Index Schedules nine times, and his statement dated the 6th of October 1985, listed on the schedule four times, has never been disclosed. Ainsley wrote his first report to the Director of Public Prosecutions on the 23rd of September 1985, in which he included evidence to persuade the DPP to charge Jeremy with five counts of murder. In this first report, Ainsley described where the telephones were within the house on the morning of the 7th of August 1985. Ainsley wrote, In the kitchen, situated on top of a work surface beneath the hatchway leading to the bottle room, was a normal dial telephone colour white. This was in working order. The handset was found removed from the cradle. In the company office on the first floor was a blue coloured telephone with a digital display and memory. There is no evidence to suggest this telephone was used on the night in question, but it was used by an officer of the Essex Police Tactical Firearms Group after the farmhouse was entered. This telephone will retrieve on the display only the last number dialed, which is automatically erased by the next use. Found in the office was a third telephone on a shelf. It is believed that this telephone was from the main bedroom, having been unplugged and the cord wrapped around the set. This cannot be explained, but the set and bedroom plug have been checked by telecommunications employees and both are in working order. In writing this, Ainsley twice deceived the DPP. As set out earlier, Harris did not use the office telephone. It can now be shown with certainty that he used the cream dial telephone which was in the kitchen. Additionally, it was this cream dial phone which was normally kept in the bedroom, not the one which Ainsley claimed was on the shelf in the office, a fact he was fully aware of. Importantly, Ainsley misled the DPP in his failure to describe the telephone which he stated was found in the office was a third telephone on a shelf and that it had the cord wrapped around the set. In his second report, which he submitted to the DPP dated the 7th of November 1985, Ainsley was now determined to make a big issue about this and he typed in capitals the following on the report. It is my opinion that Jeremy Bamber manipulated the removal of the bedroom telephone to prevent the Bambers calling the police should his entry to the house be heard. The second part of his plan was of course thwarted by the removal from the kitchen on the 5th of August 1985 of the cordless telephone with the memory redial facility. But we can now prove that Ainsley deliberately misled the DPP because Jeremy had not moved any of the telephones and the cream dial telephone found in the kitchen was put there as a result of the normal kitchen telephone being taken for repair. Ainsley was fully aware of this as he had the statements from Jean Bootle and Barbara Wilson at the time. In addition, the trial jury were misled as the telephone found hidden in the pile of magazines was not hidden on the day of the tragedies, but weeks later. So how do we know this? 
Ainsley was clear when he made his report to the DPP in September 1985 that there was a telephone on a shelf in the office which had the cord wrapped around the set. He also described the cream dial telephone in the kitchen and the blue scepter telephone connected to the line in the office. Therefore, this accounts for the three telephones that are well documented as being in the farm on the 7th of August 1985. Jean Bootle gave the following evidence about the telephone she found in the magazines. In the middle of the pile was the fawn-coloured digital telephone with its cord wound around it. This was the telephone which was normally in the kitchen on the right-hand end of the working surface. Again, the date that Mrs Bootle made this discovery was on the 24th of August 1985, over two weeks after the incident. Therefore, this telephone, originally described by Ainsley as being on a shelf in the office on the 7th of August 1985, which was found with the cord wrapped around it within a stack of magazines in the kitchen 17 days later, cannot possibly have been hidden by Jeremy, as Ainsley had argued. The only explanation is that it must have been moved by either a family member or a police officer on an undisclosed day and time. It's known that the family were given the keys to the house by the police on the 9th of August 1985 and that by their own admission they were looking for clues. It's also documented that many people, including the relatives and police officers, were in and out of the house between the 9th of August 1985 and the 24th of August 1985. Any one of these individuals could have moved the telephone from the shelf in the office to the kitchen, and this may have been done innocently. However, we believe that the telephone was deliberately moved days after it was originally seen on the office shelf. This was in order to fit with the scenario of the relatives and key members of Essex Police that Jeremy had hidden a telephone to deny Neville and June the opportunity to telephone the police during the shootings. Did D.S. Jones move this telephone when he was in the house with Anne Eaton D.I. Miller and D.I. Cook when they were taking a penknife to the underside of the Argus around? Was it Ainsley himself? Why did Ainsley knowingly lie to the DPP? Why won't Essex police disclose the crime scene photographs of the upstairs office which would clarify if this telephone was indeed on the shelf on the 7th of August 1985? It's certainly known that the police were active within the house and that D.S. Jones had instructed Anne Eaton on numerous documented occasions that she was not to disclose specific things that she'd seen the police doing in the house. The evidence that the police did instruct her in this way is contained in draft copies of Anne's statements, not in the final typed versions. There were several entries that contained instructions such as They took the shoes and said, You haven't seen this? And but I wasn't supposed to see what they were doing. Why? I don't know. Perhaps if Jeremy asked. Perhaps D.I. Jones asked. I don't know. A further interest regarding this issue is the evidence of D.C. David Bird. He was the official police photographer responsible for photographing the scene on the morning of the 7th of August 1985. D.C. Bird gave evidence that he was instructed by D.I. Cook to take photographs in every room in the house, instructions he stated he complied with. This is also confirmed in paragraph 179 of the typed Dickinson report, which states, A thorough record was made of the scene, with photographs being taken in all rooms throughout the house. However, I'm sure you're not going to be surprised to hear that no photographs have ever been disclosed of the upstairs office which had the shelves with the telephone on, which had the cord wrapped around the set as described by Ainsley. Essex police deliberately deceived not only the DPP but the judge and the jury in the fabrication of this false evidence which was then used to create a scenario to suit the agenda of police officers DSI Ainsley and DS Jones.
Thanks for listening to this podcast. If you'd like to do something to help Jeremy Bamber, then sign our online petition to the Home Secretary for the disclosure of case documents that are still withheld by Essex Police. Visit www.change.org and search for Jeremy Bamber. Don't forget to share the link with your friends and family.